Good day. As I've had occasion to say uh, recently, uh, 2021 has turned out to be a vintage year for military exercises. We've had military exercises by the NATO alliance and by the United States and its Pacific allies. We've had NATO exercises in places like the Black Sea and in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. But we've also had other exercises, some of them very large in scale, conducted by the Eurasian powers. A few weeks ago, for example, the Russians and the, with some of their allied states, including Belarus and Kazakhstan, conducted in the western regions of Russia and on the territory of Belarus, the uh, very large Zapad 2021 exercises. These were very large combined arms exercises involving perhaps 20,000 troops, not 200,000, as some people have claimed, and which, in fact, demonstrated the convincing superiority in terms of conventional weapons that the Russians now possess in land warfare along their western borders. But it, we've, it is the exercises between China and Russia, the, the, these two countries, which have been conducting exercises to a increasing degree and which are forging steadily ahead in um, uh, developing their strategic partnership alliance, if you prefer. It is those exercises which perhaps, in terms of history, will probably turn out to be the most important. And a few weeks ago, as you will remember from uh, a programme I did at that time, there was a major exercise by the Chinese and Russian armies on Ru uh, Chinese territory. The defence ministers of the two countries both attended. There was a joint command staff. We weren't, at the, we weren't at least in the publicly released material I've seen. I, given the name of the overall commander, but I'm assuming since the exercise took place in China that it was a Chinese general. And we also know that the two headquarters the uh, uh, um, overall headquarters in Moscow of the Russian military and the general staff and the headquarters of the Chinese People's Liberation Army in Beijing also directly participated in the exercise through distant control mechanisms. And as I also discussed over the course of that uh, program that I did, one of the most striking features of that particular exercise was that the Chinese deployed their um, top-of-the-line J-20 fighter jet over the course of that exercise, allowing the Russians to obtain a um, detailed, make a detailed assessment of its technology and capabilities. And at the same time, the Chinese also allowed the Russians, Russian troops, to examine Russian uh, Chinese armoured vehicles and to test them themselves. By the way, since that exercise took place, we've had a number of reports, both from uh, China, but from especially Russia, about the overall impression that the two militaries made on each other. The Russian military, uh, their account of the exercise is that they were impressed by the technical proficiency of the Chinese troops and of the um, quality, the advanced quality of China's military equipment. They were also very impressed by the high quality and morale of the Chinese uh, troops themselves. They did have some concerns, apparently, about the leadership quality of some of the Chinese officers at middle level. They lack the experience in war that the Russians have now developed over the last 20 or so years. And apparently that is one area, the specific area, where the Russians feel the Chinese military has some room for improvement. But that is the purpose of exercises. It is to give each side some idea of what the other side uh, is best at and where its weaknesses are, so that the two militaries can exchange opinions engage in constructive criticism with each other and chart ways forward, playing to each other's strengths. Well, those military exercises, those ground-based exercises, uh, 
have now been followed by equally impressive and very large scale uh, naval exercises which are taking place in the Sea of Japan. And here I think we can say definitely that in terms of naval warfare, it is the Chinese, at least uh, in terms of na surface warfare, it is the Chinese who have the decisive advantage. And um, we have had a long discussion of this exercise from Global Times, um, in which they discuss the, na the size and development and capabilities of the Chinese uh, 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 Navy ships that are participating in this exercise. And um, I, I will read out a, a bit of what the Chinese say. This is, from, this is taken from Global Times. And it reads as follows. China-Russia hold joint naval drill in Sea of Japan, display higher level of trust capability. And the article goes on to say the following. With China's advanced Type 055, a 10,000 ton class large destroyer, for the first time joining an exercise with a foreign navy, China and Russia on Thursday kicked off a joint naval drill in the Sea of Japan in a move that Chinese experts say said not only displays the two sides' high level of strategic mutual trust, but also will enhance their capability to jointly deal with maritime security threats and safeguard regional peace and stability at a time when Western countries are building antagonistic regional security organisations like the Quad and AUKUS. The Naval Interaction 2021 Marine Maritime Military Exercise started in waters near Russia's Peter the Great Gulf in the Sea of Japan on Thursday, with the Chinese People's Liberation Army sending advanced warships, including the Type 055 large destroyer Nanchang, the Type 052D destroyer Kunming, the Type 054A frigates, Binjiao and Liu Zhao, and the Type 903A comprehensive supply ship Dongping Hu, as well as fixed wing anti submarine warfare aircraft and vessel borne helicopters from the eastern, southern, and northern theatre commands. Whilst Russia will deploy large anti submarine ships, frigates, and aircraft. During the drill, which is a normal and annually scheduled arrangement, but which is also held amid many profound changes and the pandemic, the Chinese and Russian navies will practice communications, sea mine countermeasures, air defence, live fire shooting at maritime targets, joint manoeuvring and joint anti-submarine missions, according to the PLA Navy. The goal of the joint drill is to enhance the two navies' friendly, pragmatic cooperation, hone the capabilities to fight and enhance their capabilities to jointly deal with maritime security threats and safeguard regional peace and stability. Zhang Tsunshe, a senior research fellow at the PLA Naval Military Studies Research Institute, told Global Times. It will also examine the PLA Navy's far sea capabilities, including those in command, air defence, anti-ship, anti-submarine, reconnaissance, early warning, communication and navigation. The Chinese vessels did not conduct assembly or rehearsal and started the drill directly, which is closer to real combat and will contribute to their capabilities in safeguarding the security of far sea transport lanes and other maritime interests. As the largest maritime drill series between China and Russia, the naval interaction has been held nine times since 2012. This is the first time China's 10,000 ton class large Type 055 destroyer has participated in a drill abroad. Zhang said that the Type 055 large destroyer will be the command ship in the fleet during the drill 
and it will display its outstanding comprehensive capabilities, including long-range deten detection, early warning and intelligence integration. This is also the third time in 2021 the Type 055 has entered the Sea of Japan. The first time was in March and the second time in August. This reflects that the PLA's far sea training in this region is becoming routine and it is becoming more and more confident with its growing capabilities. Shi Hung, executive chief editor of the Chinese magazine Shipborne Weapons, told Global Times on Thursday. Just like the J-20 stealth fighter jet, which for the first time participated in the china russia Zapad inter Interaction 2021 joint exercise in August, the Type 055 is another of the People's Liberation Army's most powerful tools. This displays a new high of mu military mutual trust between the two countries, Song Zhongping, a Chinese military expert and TV commentator, told Global Times. The Naval Interaction 2021 drill comes at a time when the United States, India, Australia and Japan are holding Malabar Naval Drill in the Bay of Bengal, and all shortly, also shortly after, six countries, including the US, the UK and Japan, held drills in the South China Sea and surrounding areas. New regional security organisations like Quad and AUKUS are serious threats to both China and Russia, and the joint drill between the two countries will contribute to regional peace and stability. Li Shu Yin an expert at the PLA Academy of Military Sciences, told Global Times previously that the joint drills between China and Russia have become routine and are completely normal, and if other countries see them as threats, they must have guilty consciences and want to stigmatise China and Russia. So we learn a great deal from this uh, particular article in Global Times. We learn, for example, that part of the exercise is happening in Russian waters um, in the Peter the Great uh, Straits in the, South, in, the, in the Sea of Japan. And we'll come to the importance and relevance of that shortly. But we learn, as I said, that there's been a significant uh, that the part of this exercise is taking place in Russian waters, thus the fact that the exercise is taking place, as the Chinese would say, abroad. The second thing to say is that though this is clearly the ninth in a series of naval exercises the Chinese and the Russian navies have held, conducted together, it's fairly clear when you drill down and look at which ships are participating in this particular exercise that it is probably the largest and probably also the one that involves the most advanced naval ships. And the naval sh ship, the Chinese naval ship, that um, is that, you know, most striking and most important in um, this particular exercise is, of course, the Type 055 um, super Chinese super destroyer. Now, this warship has been compared by some people to the Arleigh Burke uh, class destroyers of the US Navy. However, it is bigger, significantly bigger, and it appears to possess a very advanced capability, both in terms of air defense and surveillance, and in terms of anti-ship uh, uh, capabilities. However, there's been some suggestions, which I've seen in some places, that though the Chinese are extremely advanced in terms of their electronics and the um, automation, the uh, computer systems aboard their warships. And though apparently their radar systems are exceptionally advanced, their rocket and missile systems lag those of the Americans and of the Russians. Certainly the Chinese have not so far, or not yet, deployed a hypersonic anti-ship cruise missile on their warships as the Russians are now preparing to do 
with their development of the Zircon anti-ship cruise missile. However, it's possible that discussions between the Chinese and the Russians are underway for the Russians to um, transfer such technology, anti-ship hypersonic missile technology, to the Chinese, in which case, of course, assuming that such a missile can be integrated into the Type 0 55 destroyer, which it might, might require, by the way, very substantial modification. But at that point, we would be looking at a very formidable warship indeed. Having said that, for the moment, it's clear that this is a powerful exercise, and the fact that the Type 0 55 destroyer, super destroyer, is participating in it, as the Chinese in global times are saying, is on their part a major sign of trust towards the Russians. Because just as the use of the J-20 stealth fighter jet in the August exercise between the ground forces, which I previously covered for this channel, um, was a way of the Chinese providing the Russians with information about the technology and capabilities of the J-20 fighter jet, uh, information, by the way, which certainly with respect to other countries would be considered highly classified. So the fact that the Type 055 destroyer has participated in this exercise will also provide the Russians with a great deal of insight and knowledge about the capabilities of this particular warship. And I would add, by the way, that the United States would be particularly interested in having this information, the exact capabilities of the Type 055 are something of an enigma and something of a mystery for the United States. And I've no doubt at all that the Americans would love to know more about it. Well, the Russians now do know about more about it, but of course the Americans don't. And again, we're going to come to that in a moment. But it's also perhaps fair to point out that the Type 055 isn't just there for its technology to be shared. It is clearly the um, um, fleet flagship of the Chinese fleet that's participating in this exercise. And I strongly suspect that it is ov the overall flagship of the whole exercise. Just as there appears to have been a joint command post um, established um, in, um, um, at, during the land exercise back in August. So there seems to be a joint command post in this naval exercise that has now taken place in the Sea of Japan. And it looks as if that command post was located on the Type 055 destroyer, which suggests that a Chinese admiral was in overall charge. If so, I would point out that the Chinese have been leading a naval exercise, part of which has been conducted in Russian waters, or at least in waters close to Russia. Now, of course, it's not just the Chinese who were participating in this exercise. The Russians were also, and they've also provided a description of the exercise. And um, I'm now going to read it. This is drawn from the Russian Defence Ministry's website, and it reads as follows. Combat ships and support vessels of the Russian Navy and the Navy of the People's Republic of China began practical actions during Joint Sea 2021 naval exercise in the Sea of Japan. During the first stage of the exercise, the base minesweepers of the Pacific Fleet, that's the Russian fleet, guided ships of the two countries behind the trawls and ensured the deployment of forces in the waters of the Sea of Japan. During the passage by sea, the sailors of Russia and China conducted a training session on organising communications and tactical manoeuvring. As the com at the combat training range, the United Detachment worked out tasks for the mine defence of ships. As part of this episode of the exercise, the ships of the Russian Navy 
and the People's Liberation Army Navy conducted artillery fire at a mock up of the sea floating mine posing a danger to navigation. Later, the crews will perform artillery fire at a na naval towed shield imitating a surface combat ship of a mock enemy and will solve the detachment's air defence missions. The ships will be opposed by multifunction Sukhoi 30 SM fighters of the Russian Air Force and Air Defence Army of the Eastern Military District and Russian helicopters of the Pacific Fleet's naval aviation. The joint Russian-Chinese naval exercise is held in the Sea of Japan from 14th to 17th October. The Russian Navy is represented by warships and support vessels of the Pacific Fleet, the large anti-submarine ship and the Admiral Pantaleev, the corvettes of the Project 20380, hero of the Russian Federation, Alda Tsidal Tsidenjapov, and Gromki, two base minesweepers, a submarine ust Bolsheretsk, as well as a missile boat and a rescue tug. From the Chinese People's Liberation Army naval forces, the destroyers Kunming and Nanchang, the corvettes Binzhao and Liu Zhao, as well as the, a diesel submarine, an integrated supply ship and a rescue vessel are involved. The day before, a detachment of Chinese ships arrived at the anchorage area in the water area of Peter the Great Bay. So the Chinese have much more advanced and more powerful naval ships at the present time than the Russians do. The Russians do have a um, surface, uh, um, a, a programme to build up their surface navy but it is still very much in its early stages. Um, they're building amphibious helicopter carriers in the Crimea. They're starting uh, a series production. They're now, in fact, heavily engaged in series production of the Admiral Gorshkov class corvette. And we, will, and we will be seeing, no doubt, before very long, more warships of that scale appearing in the Russian Navy also. I would add that Russian naval um, 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 descriptions of warships are somewhat different from those in other navies. So the Russians tend to use frigate and uh, the expression frigate, for example, to speak, to, to speak of a rather larger warship than would be the case in, um, the, in other navies. And um, they also use the term corvette to refer to a warship that would be called in most other navies a frigate and two of the warships that two of the surface warships that the russians have deployed um, in this um, in this um, exercise are two steraguchi class naval corvettes which would be called classified by the united states navy and by the chinese and British navies and other navies as uh, small frigates. And they are quite advanced. They, are, uh, they, are, they have quite advanced um, um, anti-aircraft systems and also increasingly quite potent anti-ship missiles. But having said that, there's no comparison. The Chinese navy is far more powerful in the Pacific at this time than the Russian navy is. And this is reflected in the balance of the exercise. But we learn from this Russian report a few things about some of the facts, uh, some of the, 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 the way in which the exercise was conducted. We notice that the, the early part of the exercise involved a convoy of this task force, this joint Chinese-Russian task force. As I said, a joint task force strongly suggests a single commander. And it's quite clear that single commander is based at the Type 055 Chinese destroyer, and he's almost certainly Chinese. Anyway, that task force was uh, um, escorted through uh, waters by Russian minesweepers. And the Russians, by the way, have made uh, a particular specialty of um, mine, sea mine warfare. 
and uh, they have some very advanced minesweepers. And partly the purpose of the exercise appears to have been to instruct the Chinese in this area, that the Chinese are also fairly advanced in mine warfare themselves. And then there were various other exercises, including exercises of targets, live fire exercises, and also an important air defence exercise in which the Russian Air Force acted as the aggressor party. So Russian Sukhoi-30 SM fighter jets and Russian helicopters staged mock attacks on this task force and the Chinese and the Russian warships defended themselves and that, as I said, will have given the Russians a great deal of insight about the air defence capabilities of the Type 055 super Chinese super destroyer. So that gives us some sense of the exercise, and it also shows the extent to which the Chinese and the Russians are now working together in every military field, in land warfare, at uh, the high command level, in air warfare, and also now at sea. And notice also the way the Chinese are, in that article in Global Times, quietly roping the Russians in, to their alliance system. They're talking about AUKUS as an alliance that is hostile to China. Well, the Russians have spoken out against AUKUS. They don't like this new arrangement between the United States, Britain and Australia one bit, and they've said as much. But the Chinese also refer in that global article to the Quad as being also a uh, potential security threat and, of course, the Russians will probably feel some misgivings about that because they still have very close and very friendly relations with India with which Russia is in a conflict situation. Anyway, a big exercise, advanced warships involved, almost certainly a Chinese admiral in overall charge, a great deal of, um, of mutual learning of combat capabilities, and a great deal of advanced study by the Russians of the capabilities of the Type 055 destroyer. The Chinese are sharing some of their most sensitive military secrets with the Russians, and we can be sure that the Russians are sharing some of their military secrets in return. One country, obviously, took an interest in all of this, and decided that it was going to trespass into the exercise and find out more about what, it was, what was going on. And that, of course, was the United States. It was the United States decided that it would deploy one of its Arleigh Burke uh, destroyers into the area. It was going to infiltrate the seas where this exercise is being conducted, and it was obviously going to test... Uh, um, uh, and carry out monitoring missions of this exercise. And what we've learnt is that as soon as this destroyer, this USS destroyer, the USS Chaffee, appeared on the scene, the Russians sent one of their own warships, the Admiral Tributz, a warship, by the way, which is, did not participate in this exercise, so it was sent as a kind of guard by the Russian Pacific Fleet, and the Admiral Tributz drove the USS Chaffee off. Now, I say that he drove it off. The USS Chaffee is actually, undoubtedly, the more advanced and powerful warship. But the Russians, no doubt, made all kinds of suggestions that it should leave. And the US uh, decided to comply. And we've had reports about this incident from both sides. But I'm going to read the one from Associated Press, which, though it takes a slightly American-angled account of the affair, does, in my, uh, it does, in fact, um, uh, report what each side has said, has said about this incident fairly. And we read the following. Russia's defence ministry said a Russian warship on Friday prevented a US Navy destroyer 
uh, from entering what is described, for, for, uh, dis- prevented a U.S. Navy dis- destroyer from what it described as an attempt to intrude into Russia's territorial waters in the Sea of Japan. Hours later, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command called the Russian statement false and said the ships, and that's both ships, both the Russian warships and the American warships' interaction was safe and professional. The incident came as Russia and China conducted joint naval drills in the area and followed other dangerously close encounters involving Russian and Western warships. It appears to reflect Moscow's intention to raise the stakes in deterring the US and its allies from sending their ships on missions near Russian waters as relations between Russia and the West are at a post-Cold War low. The Russian Defence Ministry said that the Russian Navy's Admiral Tribut's destroyer closely approached the US destroyer USS Chaffee to chase it out of the area near Russian waters that was declared off-limits to shipping due to the gunnery drills there as part of Russia-China manoeuvres. It said the Russian, ves- the Russian vessel came close to the US warship after it had ignored repeated warnings to leave the area in the Peter the Great Gulf. The ministry charged that after making an attempt to cross the Russian sea border, the US warship changed course when the two ships were just 60 metres away from each other and sped away. In a statement, US Indo-Pacific Command said the Chaffee was conducting routine operations in international waters when the Russian destroyer came within about 65 yards of the Chaffee as it was preparing for flight operations. It added that although Russia had issued a notice to airmen and mariners to avoid that area for a period later in the day, the notice was not in effect at the time of the ship's interaction. At all times, USS Chaffee conducted operations in accordance with international law and custom. The Russian statement denounced the US destroyer's manoeuvres as a crude violation of the international rules on averting ships' collisions and a 1972 agreement between Moscow and Washington on preventing air and naval incidents and summoned the US military attaché to protest what it described as the crew's unprofessional actions. And in fact, we have a report from the official Russian news agency TASS about that complaint that was delivered to the U.S. naval attaché in Moscow, and it reads as follows. The Russian defense ministry has summoned the U.S. military attaché and pointed out the unprofessional actions of the crew of the U.S. Navy destroyer Shafi that attempted to cross the Russian border in the Sea of Japan. The position of the Russian military agency was conveyed to the representative of the United States Armed Forces in relation to the U.S. Navy's destroyer Chaffee's attempted violation of the state border of the Russian Federation in the area of the Peter the Great Bay on October 15th. As the Defence Ministry emphasised, the unprofessional actions of the American crew were pointed out to the military attaché attaché, since they grossly violated international regulations for preventing collisions at sea and the provisions of the Russia-US agreement on preventing incidents at sea and in the airspace. The US military attaché was summoned to the main directorate for international military cooperation at Russia's defense ministry in the evening of October 15th. So, an attempt by the United States to gate crash this exercise. I think we can take some of the claims that each side is making here with a something of a pinch of salt. The Russians say that the US warship uh, um, infringed, crossed the Russian border, I'm not entirely sure that is the case. I'm not exactly sure where the Russian border is in this uh, region. Uh, The United States, of course, denies that. But the underlying point 
is that when the Americans say that they were acting in a completely routine way, that they were conducting normal navigation in these waters, and that the Russians behaved somewhat aggressively, but overall the whole thing was always under control and highly professional and that there were no dangers to either side. Well, I'm afraid the Americans are being, to be straightforward about this, misleading. Um, straightforwardly, this was clearly an attempt to gate crash. This exercise, the Russians acted immediately and promptly to prevent that happening. And the USS Chaffee was clearly under instructions to turn round rather than risk an incident with the Russians and the Russian Navy. And that is exactly what it did. So this incident in itself, perhaps, is not a huge one. The incident of the US warship is not a huge one. And it's not hardly unusual for the US to want to dis deploy a uh, uh, warships to monitor the exercises of rival powers that are taking place. There's one thing about this incident that is a little unusual. At least I think it points to it being somewhat unusual. And that is the very advanced nature of the warship that the United States Navy used in order to try to monitor this exercise. And that is uh, the USS Chaffee, which is, as I said, an Arleigh Burke destroyer. And that is a very powerful warship, one of the most powerful warships in the US Navy. In fact, the sort of warship that you would not expect to send on a mere surveillance mission, at least I would not, especially one where there was a real risk of something going wrong and where you would not want it to be put in a position where there was an incident which might cause it to fall into disrepair so that the Russians and the Chinese might be in a position to access it. The fact that the Americans went to the lengths of sending such an advanced warship to track this exercise, I think shows how um, concerned they are by these Chinese-Russian moves. I've discussed in many programmes the extent to which the Chinese naval build-up in the Pacific is now rapidly changing the geopolitical balance in the entire Pacific region. It's a geopolitical balance that is changing in a way that the United States doesn't have a clear answer to. AUKUS, this new arrangement with Australia, is not an answer. As we've discussed in previous programmes, it will take at least a decade before any uh, Australian nuclear-powered submarines start uh, uh, patrolling the Pacific, and it's debatable whether, in fact, they, they ever will. Um, so AUKUS is not a solution to this. Getting Japan to crank up its military um, challenge to China would, I think, solve problems or at least mitigate problems for a while. But the pace of China's in, uh, mil naval deployments and the increase, increase in Chinese naval power is such that the Chinese would probably fairly quickly make up whatever difference Japan, J Japan joining this naval rivalry is making. Besides, the new Japanese Prime Minister, Mr Kishida, seems to be committed to trying to improve relations with China. He's had a, a rather productive conversation, as I discussed recently, with President Xi Jinping of China, and it's not clear at the moment that Japan really is moving towards a outright naval alliance with the United States directed to China and perhaps defending Taiwan. On the other hand, the Chinese now do have an ally in the region in the form of Russia. And though the Russian Navy in the Pacific is... Uh, at the moment, at least the surface part of this navy is still op operates at a fairly low level of 
um, technological sophistication, nearly all of the warships are opposed, as opposed, except for the two Steriguchi class corvettes that I spoke about, um, date from the Soviet era. It's highly likely that it will be upgraded very soon. We, one of those two amphibious helicopter carriers that the Russians are building in the Crimea will apparently be deployed to the Russian Pacific Fleet. The Russians already have advanced nuclear submarines operating in the Sea of Okhotsk and the Sea of Japan, and these are quite possibly as sophisticated as any U.S. Navy submarines in the area, and they're certainly a lot more sophisticated than those which Japan and China possesses. But on top of that, there are rumours that the Russian um, battle cruiser, the Admiral Nekhimov, which is a 28,000-ton warship, much bigger than the Chinese Type 055, and which is currently going undergoing a simply gigantic refit, that it too is going to be deployed to Russia's Pacific fleet, where, of course, it will have a major impact on the naval balance. This particular warship will be equipped with Zircon um, anti-ship missiles, hypersonic anti-ship missiles, and it will have also um, air defence missile systems at least as sophisticated as any that the Chinese or US navies d d d Navy deploys, deploy and perhaps more sophisticated still. And then there is another thing that might perhaps cause the Americans even further concern. Some months ago, I did a programme about the Poseidon and uh, nuclear-powered submarine drone. I discussed how this was an incredibly dangerous, terrifying weapon system, equipped apparently with a massive nuclear warhead, which is intended to be launched from Russian naval waters uh, against the US coastline, and which would create massive devastation along the coastal areas of the United States, where most of the US population resides and where most of much of US industry is based. And it's perhaps interesting that the first submarine which will operate these uh, terrifying weapons, the Khabarovsk, which has now been launched and is being deployed, is apparently going to be deployed in the Pacific. And the, the Russians seem to be intending to deploy the Poseidon submarine drone in the Pacific also. In which case, of course, it would be potentially capable of targeting the US West Coast, cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco. And of course, it would also pose an absolutely deadly threat to Japan in fact, it would be the kind of weapon system that I suspect would be exceptionally alarming for the Japanese were it ever to be deployed in those sort of waters. So this is a game changer system, uh, almost a doomsday machine, if you like. And the Russians look like they're going to deploy it in the Pacific. And I do wonder whether this particular exercise that the Chinese and the Russians have just conducted in the Sea of Japan and in what the Russians claim is their territorial waters is partly connected to the future plans to deploy the Poseidon nuclear-powered submarine drone to these waters. I say that because the nature of this deployment, the use of the Type 055 destroyer, the uh, attention to uh, um, using to, to anti-mine warfare, um, all of these matters. It looks as if this was a surface fleet, an exercise of a surface fleet intended to provide cover for whatever submarine, Russian Navy submarine, might be intending to deploy and launch 
the Poseidon nuclear-powered submarine drone. That is purely my guess. Nobody has reported that. Anybody with any thoughts on this topic is welcome to express them. But it did make me wonder, I have to say, when I saw the place where this exercise is taking place, whether that might be part of the agenda. But regardless, at the moment, as I said, the, Chi the Russian Navy in the Pacific, at least the surface part of this Navy, is old and perhaps even obsolescent and is in urgent need of reinvigoration. But reinvigorated soon it will be. The Admiral Nakhimov uh, battlecruiser may soon be deployed there. We might, before very long, see Admiral uh, Gorshkov class frigates. The United States uh, would regard those sort of frigates as sort of small but very potent destroyers. They also operate hypersonic systems. And one gets the sense, and of course, um, helicopter um, carriers are also being, Russia is also building helicopter carriers, which it also looks as if it might be intending at some point to deploy there. So whatever one may think about AUKUS and all these other plans, the, these are construction programs that the Russians have in being. They're obviously on a much smaller scale than the vast Chinese naval program. But it does mean that in five, ten years, we will start to see a Russian Navy in the Pacific, which would form a potent addition to the, to the overall military balance and which could be a powerful ally to China. And of course, if there is some kind of joint planning between the Chinese and the Russians about over how to deploy and operate the Poseidon nuclear-powered submarine drone, then the alarm of the United States becomes fully explicable. I wonder whether that might be the reason why the US tried to gatecrash this exercise with an Ali Burke destroyer. I'm not saying maybe using potent warships like that, putting them in potential harm's way by deploying them close to the war fleets of other powers is standard practice with the United States. People who are more knowledgeable about these things than me might wish to enlighten me. But certainly it is a case that the Chinese and the Russians are working hard. They're forging their naval partnership, which is, of course, part of their overall strategic partnership, which now covers every single area of their relations. And that the United States at the moment doesn't have any clear or obvious response to what is happening. I suspect that over the next five, ten years, if nothing happens in the Pacific to change this picture, to change this trajectory of travel, things are going to become increasingly tense and they're going to increasingly heat up. And that doesn't even take into consideration what might happen in over the island, the, the contested island of Taiwan. One way of the other, or the other, it looks to me as if the Pacific Ocean is becoming increasingly less Pacific and increasingly more troubled. Well, thank you for joining me for this program today. I hope you will join me soon for few further programs on this channel. In the meantime, you can also check us out at our main channel, The Duran, where I do programs with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforu. Please also remember to check out Alex's channel. You will find links under this video. Please also look us up on our other platforms, in particular Locals, where we have a thriving community, where we are increasingly publishing exclusive content, and where we have all sorts of uh, uh, people, members of our community, publishing their own content also, and engaging us and each other in all sorts of discussions 
I should say that I'm learning lots of useful things from following these discussions on Locals. And if you really want to attract my attention, if you really want me to, if you really want to write something, which I'm, uh, I'm going to read and attend to and probably respond to in a programme, for example, the better place to do it is, is on Locals, where, as I said, if you join our community, um, you can be absolutely guaranteed that your comments will be seen and read. And also, we are also obviously involved in other channels, other platforms too, like BitChute, Library, Rumble, Odyssey, and above all, the new free speech platform, SuperU. And of course, you can also support us through our, uh, through Patreon and Subscribestar, and also by going to our shop and buying the amazing things that you will find there, our famous magic mugs, our wonderful hats, <laughs> our hoodies, our sweatshirts, our t-shirts, and all the rest. And if you've liked this programme, remember to press the like button, and remember to check your subscription to this channel, and thank you for joining me again today.